Hello. Hi, I am Kutwish. Uh, and uh, I am someone who's been exploring programming languages since my second year. And I have learned a lot about it. Like I've learned about the type system, the way they manage memory, the way they manage memory, the way they operate, the way they're uh, compiled, all of, all of that. Right? So uh, I feel memory management is something that everyone should know to, because it's one of the lower level concepts and it's very fundamental uh, to understand. It will help you understand your code better. It will help you understand uh, your uh, program speed, your program execution, and it will help you debug also a lot of things. So today, I will be talking about understanding memory management. So for this talk, I am assuming that all of you know C to some extent. Like you know how to like use variables in C. Okay. I am assuming you know how to initialize variables, use variables, use functions in C. So that's all, all the prerequisites that is. So and first of all, so I am assuming you know how to program a little bit. That's all. So first of all, we'll go with needle prerequisite pre -requis right, for this talk. So first of all, you need to understand something called memory layout. When your program is running, how exactly the memory is laid out for any particular program? It will be divided logically into four segments. There are four static, static, four and static sections. There are something which are fixed size. They won't change throughout the program. But stack and heap is what gives us dynamic nature in our program. Everything that is dynamic is achieved through stack and heap. In fact, okay. Okay, so first of all, we'll go into core segment. Core segment, you know how program is compiled, right? You have a program, you have a compiler. A compiler will compile that program into some instructions. Those instructions, since your program source code is fixed, of fixed size, the generated assembly or the instruction will also be a fixed size. So all of that, all of that instruction will go into the code section. Next up is static section. You will have some variables in your program whose size is known as compile time. Compile time is when you've written the code, it's there in the code itself, right? Those things, they all go to the static section. We can see that better as an example, right? This example is there, right? The, the string loaded up some, something, something, and then this one. All of it will go into the static section. While the code generated for the whole program, it will go into the code section. So that's all that, we, that is needed to know about code section and static section for this talk. The more interesting bits are stack and heap. We'll talk about them in more detail. So first of all, the stack allegation. What is stack? Do? Stack will store all the local variables. Like when you are calling a function, it returns something that is also stored in the stack. All the variables are stored in the stack. The way you achieve function calls is also through stacks. So that is what a stack does. And let's see that clearer with an example. Right? This is this is a simple program which is which has int a, int b, and some array. It is declaring variables, and they have some values inside them. Right? So how this will be laid out in stack is somewhat like this. So first of all, this is just a stack section. I am uh, removing the code static and heap section for now. So this is how it will be laid out. 10 will be there and 20 will be there. 1 and 2 because they are part of the array. That is how stack will be laid out. That's all for stack allocation for now. Okay. Next up is heap. Heap, many programming languages as you know, allows you to uh, Allocate and deallocate memory manually. In C, you will maybe use malloc malloc free, right? If you haven't used also, I'll tell about them in coming slides. So heap is man used to manage long-lived data. First of all, I'll tell you what a long-lived data is and what short-lived data is. When you have a function, when you're calling a function, you let's say in this function, right? In this main function, right? You had all of this, right? Let's say this was some function f and we had called it, and then all of this was happening inside that function. So we call that function, all of this will be there. After that function comes back, returns, all of this will be gone. So that is short lived data. The data that is not persisted across function calls is short lived data, while long lived data is something that will persist. Right? That is separated, like allocated in a separate section called heap. That will be long lived. So in order to access such data, you just need a pointer to it. So that's long lived. And heap allocation is absolutely unavoidable when you have some 
dynamic program. Let's say you have a, an array which will have some size n, but that n you will not know at one time. You only know it at one time. For example, uh, this code here, right? We are doing a scanner which will read the input from user, and then after that we will call it f with n. n will what n will do is it will call malloc with n and then return that. That is this malloc call here, right? It is what is doing the heap allocation. So after the heap allocation is done, we will return it and this is like, after this was this function called return, this is still there, the thing that was returned by this still exists because it is long lived data. Now after that, we will free it because we are good programmers, good programmers free memory that we are using. So C++ provides, the C++ provides these three function, functions mainly to do heap allocation and then uh, reallocation. They are malloc, reallocation, free. But let's say you do not know about them. They are in summary, basically this malloc x will allocate x bytes in the heap. That's what malloc does, and then return you the address of it, address of the allocated memory. Realloc p and x, p is pointer, x is a new size. So what it will do is, for a previously allocated pointer p, let's say you allocated p with malloc call, some address was returned, that is p. But now you want the size to be increased. Let's say Best example would be you have an array of size 5 first, right? You allocate with malloc. Now you want the array to be of size 10. So, in order to do that, it is called realloc pointer with 10. That will give you, you can, that will expand the array for you. You can even uh, like reduce the size if you want. So, the free, free call is basically you ask the operating system for memory. Now, after you are done with the memory, you should be freeing it. That's what free will do. So now I think you have enough background about allocation and deallocation. So we'll move on to the main content, like introduction to memory management. Memory management is all about using the heap memory correctly. We do not need to be concerned with stack because stack allocations are automatically free, as shown in that main function, right? A, B, all those variables that were allocated, they were on the stack and they were freed automatically. They are managed with something called scopes. I'll talk about that in the next slide. And if you do heap memory management incorrectly, it will lead to program crashes, slowdowns. There are different techniques for managing heap memory. I will mention them soon. So, what is the scope thing that I just told? So, this is easier to understand than an example. This is a given, one example, right? This is a function here. I am, you can think of scope as a block of code, which is uh, enclosed by a matching parenthesis. Matching curly brace, right? This is basically it. This is the scope one, and this is scope two because I created one uh, matching point like pair. It's basically it. That's all the scope. All there is to know about scope. So now, you see, I told that this function won't compile. This function won't compile because at the end it's returning B, but B is in a child scope of uh, scope one, right? Scope one is the topmost scope. Scope two is its child scope. Scope three is its child child scope. So this is something not within scope 1, this is in its child scope, I think it's easier to understand the diagram. So the relation that they have is every child scope will be able to access all the variables that are in its, uh, that are available till its root scope. This is the, the main function, the f function is the root scope, so everything from, everything like this right, all the paths that are going to the root is accessed by a children. But scope 1 won't be able to access anything in scope 2, scope 4 or scope 5. That is what was happening here. Here, this is in scope 1, the function is return b is in scope 1. But the b variable is defined in scope 2. And scope 2 is a child of scope 1, so it cannot be accessed. I hope that's clear. So this is all that you know about scope. Scope, with scopes, it will basically help us to do a lot of things. I will tell you one more thing. Like, perfect use case of what uh, scope is doing. So next up is, why should I care about free memory? Is it really a problem? So, it's not really a problem if you have infinite amount of storage, but in most of practical systems, that is not the case. So, one big problem is, if one program, in, in your system, there will always be like hundreds of programs running, even thousands for like some time, right? So, in that case, all of them are using some memory, right? And let's say one program is using a lot of memory. It will store all of this data in the memory, right? 
if one program is using that memory, other program cannot just reuse that memory, right? That memory that program one is taking. So there is some security issues that will arise if you try to reuse memory because we are basically leaking the private information of one program to another. We do not want that. The OS itself won't allow that. That's why we need memory to be allocated and deallocated properly. And the biggest thing is your program may just crash if you ask for a memory that is not even there. If you have an 8 GB RAM system and you ask for memory more than that, there's no way your operating system will be able to provide that. So it is just crash saying out of memory. So there is this thing called memory leak, which is a very big concern for long running programs. What are long running programs? You have a, let's say VLC media player, right? You use that to watch movies or something. You you have browsers. That also it's a long running program because you use it, you use it for a long amount of time. Even uh, web servers that are serving all the contents for us in the internet, all of them are long running programs. They just don't run for like five minutes, two minutes, something like that. They'll go on for a long time. So those programs, if they have memory leak, that will have a significant impact on your system. So I just told you something called memory leak. What is it? Memory leak is when you ask the system for memory, but you never actually free it back. So basically, you are always doing malloc of God, but there is no free for that. So that is when you cause a memory leak. That is basically like using memory, but you are never returning it. So that will lead to memory usage being high and it is crap. So we will come to ways to manage memory now. How do we do memory management? We have two ways to do memory management. One of the ways is manually do it. Manual memory management. Language is like C, C++, plus half this. They will, like, you know this, right? Because you are doing malloc for yourself and C++ you might do new and delete yourself. So, that is manual memory management. The other thing is automatic memory management. The language that you are using, that will help you out with memory management. It will do all the allocation, the allocation for you automatically. You do not actually ever need to think about memory. Languages like Python, Java, Go, all of them will use automatic memory management. Higher level language than C, C++, plus plus plus. So, first of all, we will talk about manual memory management. You see this program here. This looks very harmless, right? We have a malloc call, we call that function, we free it here. It seems like it's not doing anything wrong. But if you see what exactly it's doing, I'll tell the flow. So what we're doing is we're calling the allocated flow function. That function it will allocate n size array in heap, and then if the n value was less than 10, it will throw an exception. What is an exception now? Exception is something that is a way to signal that something went wrong in your program. So, so like the program, the specification for this function is that it should throw error if n was less than 10. But this is kind of very dumb code, right? Because if I move this here, this this thing here to here, that is the better way to do this, right? Why allocate if you are going to throw exception right in the next statement? That that is not good. But this just for Demonstration purpose that where it demonstration purpose show where it can go wrong. This function is like this. So, and then this try catch block. You may not have seen this before. If you just you see, you may not have seen this before. This is basically whatever is in the, in the try block, right? Whatever here throws any sort of exception, or it will say that something went wrong, all of that will be caught, like whatever. Like if this statement throws an exception, it will catch it and then go here inside the other catch block, right? That is what will happen in case of exception. And so, whatever, like whichever statement from these two throw an exception, it will move the program to here. So, that is exception handling. The, we are just using a C feature right now. And it is enough to know just this that whatever goes inside this, if something goes wrong, it will go here. So, here, the problem here is we are allocating and throwing. So, we pass it through, 2 is less than 10. So, we are getting this case here exactly. So the program will abort right from here, it will come here, since it's your exception, it will go here now. The free call isn't happening at all. So this is what the path, the program flow looks like. What is the program flow? Program flow is the path that a program will take when it's running. So this was the flow that it took, right? We called it with n. So it came here, it came here, it threw a runtime error, memory leak. We just need memory. If it went this way, it would have been perfect. Like we, do, we wouldn't have caused any problems. But now we wash it away. We can see that also, right? I wrote this function in something called a 
there's a tool online for the compiler explorer where you can compile the programs and then see how. So I compiled this with a certain flag which will help us detect uh, memory leaks. So as you can see here, the same code here, right, is actually detecting the memory leak. It's telling 8 byte was leaked. So how do we fix this? Do not write dumb code like I did there. Like you should, whenever you are doing memory management stuff, you should always think carefully before writing code. It should be like, this is where it will go out of scope and this is where it will free. That is what you should do first of all. Sometimes even that won't be enough because there will be a lot of cases when you can't like actually go through all the paths and then think of a way to manage it properly. So you should try to write code in a more higher level language like C++ or Rust. So language like C++ and Rust, they come with something called smart pointers. Smart pointers are pointers, they're just like normal pointers, but they will automatically manage the memory for you. They'll automatically deallocate and need it. For now, I'm, I'm just going to talk about this unique pointer type. There is another type there as well, but it will come up later in the talk. So let's try to fix that leaking code. This is a leaking code, right? Now, if we use unique pointers, it becomes like this. So this is something that is provided by C++ itself. It's a library. It's part of standard library. So you don't need to download an extra packages to use it or something like that. So what we just did is we just changed these two lines. We changed the function signature and then we changed the way we allocate it. But you might see that there is no free call here. What the hell is happening, right? There is no free call. I am doing new. New is basically mal of C++. So just think of it that way. I am using C++ because it's, it has better facilities. Like I want to tell you about the smart way to do stuff. So I can't do that. See, this does not exist in C. You have to resort to mal of and free always. So, for now, I just change these two things and then I'm telling you it works automatically for some reason. But I am never actually freeing stuff. It shouldn't there be a leak there. But in actual, like, there's no leak here. Now I'll tell you why that works. Smart pointers, why do they work? They use, as I mentioned before, scope to track lifetime of pointers, right? So, what happened in the example, right, here? In this example, we allocated this uh, array here. This was allocated. Now we went to this. We went to this block, right? But we exit right from this block. What? The this will be freed when this is encountered as well. But C doesn't do that. C doesn't have the ability to do that. But C++ does. So after this is the child scope. The whole scope will get deallocated, right? So this is gone. But if it encounters this, it will return this to another scope. It will. The owner of the variable has changed. So it will be here now and then will, it will automatically get freed again because this scope will be terminated. So that will go out of scope again. So this is like using scope very well. right? So C++ has something called destructors. Think of destructors as some, post, some code that you run, some function that you run when some one object goes out of scope. right? We know what a scope is. So we're just attaching some amount of code that needs to be run. When the object goes out of scope, that's simple. That's basically how it does it, right? This is part of something called IIA in C++. You might want to look it up later on. This stands for resource acquisition is initialization. This doesn't say anything about what it is at all. This is just bad naming. So what exactly is RIA? RIA can be summarized as two things. Whenever you have a C++ class, the way you create an object of the class is through constructors and then the way the object is destroyed is through destructors and then destructors will run at the end of scope. That is the only rule that is there in C++ for classes. So I told that, that destructors will be called right now. You see this code here. I defined a struct. This is the constructor for that scope. This is the destructor for that scope. Right? We are calling the constructor here when we are initializing the class but we never actually call this function right explicitly. So what has happened? So C++ compiler is smart enough to actually know where it should put the destructor calls automatically. So right here, right, it actually put the destructor call as you can see. This is the generated assembly for the C++ code here. This is the code. This is what we called ourselves. This is object constructor. This is the object destructor that is automatically added. We have never actually added it. The compiler is smart enough to do this. So this is the underlying concept for smart pointer. So Let's try to make our own unique pointer. But, okay, just know this that this is not a perfect example of unique pointer. Unique pointers 
are generic, but we are only making it for an integer. So this is an eight pointer class type where like defined, right? Inside the class, it just has an integer pointer. But in the constructor, we are allocating it. In the destructor, we are freeing it. That's all we need to do. Now everything will automatically work. See here, there is no memory leak message, right? Like in the like in the last like, previous slide, there was memory allocation like memory leak uh, notified here with in red color. Nothing like that is there. That means memory is being managed properly. We didn't even need to do much. We just need to add the destructor and constructor properly. That's all. And then smart pointer, like the unique pointer type, will actually have a lot more code than this. It will have assignment operator, it will have other types of functions as well, but we will skip that because that is, that kind of reserves a talk on its own. So now, is unique pointer the only smart pointer? No. There is another pointer type, as I told before, that we will say in detail later on. But, is not unique pointer perfect already, right? It allocates something for us when we want, and it allocates when it goes out of scope. Isn't that enough? Problem with unique pointer is unique pointer can be owned by one thing at a time. It can never be owned by multiple things. It has ownership problem. A perfect example for unique pointers use like uh, a perfect example for when unique pointer doesn't work well is a Unix file is Now I tell you what a Unix file is in In your Linux, if you are using Linux, even if you are not, right? Uh, it's fine. Like because. In Linux, if there is a file and you want to write to a file or read from a file, what you do is you open that file in your code. That open call, open function call is used. So that open call is written to an integer. That integer is called a file descriptor. The OS internally is mapping that particular integer to the file and then it is letting us use that integer to do all the reading and writing in that file. That is Unix file. That is just you file descriptor in Linux. That's all. That's how it works. Now, the problem is, a file may have multiple owners, right? I can just open the file in multiple, I can open the file, I can use it in multiple places. A lot of variables can be modifying that file. Let's say one, one variable, one place I am reading from the file, one place I am writing from the file. It should be able to have multiple owners, right? But with the unique pointers, you can't model that. I will show you why not. Also, disclaimer, the code that is about to come is very cursed and it shouldn't be written that way. I am just hacking it together to make it a perfect example. So, but we will still do it. So, this is a file descriptor class. It has a unique pointer inside it. With an integer, I do it as an integer, right? So, you are just encapsulating that integer in your pointer. So, this is a unique pointer. What you are doing is where this is just making the unique pointer and in the destructor, we should be actually closing the file, right? Because if you open the file, you should close the file. But here, we will just print destroy it because you, that will be better for demonstration. So this operator, this assignment operator, just ignore it because uh, this is not how you, this is the hacky part that I told. This is just for demonstration purpose. So the thing is, now we have a file descriptor fd1 with value 3. It's pointing to a file descriptor with value 3. Now, I created a child scope here. Here, I will assign fd2 to fd1. So fd2 is also owning 3. fd1 is also owning 3. But fd2 will go out of scope right here, right in line 25. And, uh, what is this is there? Volume is there. Okay, so you go out of scope right here. So I put this C outline to print stuff here, right? So if I want to use the file descriptor one here, right, after the C out, I can't. It will lead to corruption, the file corruption and all that. It will, it will probably crash the program as well. So if, so, as you can see here, right, this destroyed tree right before the, before this call itself, before the C out itself. So that means it is unsafe to use it here. It destroyed the same thing twice. And if we had access it, it would have led to error. So, this is why we cannot model it properly. So, next example of point is something called a, something, some variant of a producer consumer problem. It's where it is single producer, multiple consumer, multiple producer, multiple consumer problem cannot also be modeled with unique pointer. So think of the problem as you have a queue. You have a queue with something that is a food or something, right? And there are some cooks who will put, who will put the food there in the queue. And then there are some people who will take the food from the plate and eat it. Whoever, like, whoever wants to eat it, they'll eat it. Whoever is free will eat it, right? Whoever cooks first will put the like, food in the queue. Right? Simple, right? So, in that case, it obviously makes sense that the like, cooks 
end and the heaters end, it may be owned by multiple people, right? You can think of it that way. No, because multiple people can put it on the queue, multiple people can get it from the queue. So this also boils down to the similar problem there. This also cannot be modeled by unique pointer because it just doesn't allow you multiple ownerships. So now this is a perfect segue into unique automatic memory management. So what is automatic memory management? The programming language that you are using, it will help you with memory. Like you do not have to think about memory at all. The programmers do not need to worry about it. All the allegation deallegations are hidden from the programmer. You, if you use Python or any other language like Java, right? JavaScript, Java, Python, whatever. You see that there, you are never actually making a malloc or a free call. That is because the language automatically does it for you. When you are creating an object, it's internally it's calling malloc and getting memory and then doing it, like using it. So one important terminology here is, in case of automatic memory management, this is a terminology that is used very frequently called garbage. Something, all the data that cannot be referenced by your program is garbage. For example, you have like the scope thing was there, right? Let's say you call a function f, it will have some variable a, b, c. When that function returns, whatever a, b, c was there, that is not usable. You just cannot reference that variable. So those are garbage variables. So there are two techniques used for automatic, automatic memory management. One technique is, uh, one technique will basically catch all the transitions from reachable scope to un unreachable, basically. All the garbages are captured right when it becomes garbage, basically. Right when the scope is over, it will be caught and freed. It is instantaneous. Other tech, this is what is used by Python, Swift, and then this is the other smart contract type that I hadn't mentioned yet, but I will go in detail later on. So this is what is used by all of this. And then there's another type, uh, there's another technique we use for this thing, um, automatic memory management. What that will do is, after some event happens, there will be some certain event, like they have some events, when it happens, it will trigger something called uh, a mark or like it will call a function to perform reachability analysis. What is reachability analysis? It's basically it will see what all variables can be referenced and then everything that can be referenced will be considered as reachable and then everything that cannot be referenced is just a diff different, right? You have heap, heap is a set, think of heap as a set and then after you diff like figured out all the reachable set the heap minus the reachable set is all the unreachable set. So that is what it basically does. It will happen periodically. It won't happen instantaneously when some when some variable goes out of scope. That is the difference between these two. So this is very tracing these garbage characters. This is what happens in languages like Java, Java, uh, Go, and all that. So first of all, we come to reference counting. Reference counting, as I said before, it will catch the transitions from reachable to unreachable right when it happens and freeze it, it's immediate. It is backed by very simple rules. Every allocated pointer will have one number associated with it. That is called its reference count. Every allocated pointer, every map of call will return a pointer. That pointer will have and uh, will have a number associated with it called its reference count. Every copy of that variable will implement the reference count by one. And every time the variable goes out of scope, the internal pointer's reference count will go down by one. When it reaches zero, it is safe to free the object, right? Because there is no references to it left. So we'll come to C plus plus shared pointer type. It is also a reference counted pointer implemented in C plus plus standard library. It uses uh, very it, it, it handles the reference counting very elegantly. It has reference count implementing element hidden in like assignment operator, copy constructor, destructors, all that. That is what will do all the heavy lifting for us. All the reference count, the tracking stuff will be done inside these uh, overloads. So let's solve our file descriptor issue, right? We told it couldn't be modeled by a unique pointer. Now let's model the shared pointer. So this is the file descriptor class. For now, I'm just putting it, putting like letting it have FD here, and then I'm just initializing FD, and then when it's destroyed, I'm telling destroyed FD. I'm printing it there. But obviously, this should have been a close, close function call with the FD. But for this now, what I'll do is we'll use shared pointer of FD, and then we'll have Three value inside it. Now we we'll do the same thing like we did there. We create FD2 and then we assign it to FD1. So both of both FD1 and FD2 are pointing to three. 
I'll point it to the same file descriptor. So when this goes out of scope and this is printed, right? As you can see here, after this only the tree is destroyed, not before this, like last time. That means after this also the tree with tree file descriptor, right? It's still in scope. It only goes out of scope here. So we are free to use it like in between 21 and 22 line as much as we want. So we have essentially just solved that file descriptor issue, multiple non issue issue or file descriptor. So now let's move on to also we can like I implemented a very non-generic version of unique pointer, right? We can do some, something similar with uh, file smart pointer like uh, shared pointer as well, but it may be a bit difficult to like difficult for general audience to digest that. So I I have skipped it, but if anyone wants to know the detail about that, you can uh, talk to me after the talk. Next thing is tracing this garbage collector. So as I told before, it is after some event happens. Uh, that event may be memory is over, like whatever had been allocated, it's gone, all of it is over, we've used it. That or or let's say after a periodic interval of like one second, two, one second, two second, five minutes, second, whatever. After those events, some like one reachability analysis is done. It will check what all is reachable in your system. So what does a pointer is reachable mean? Like if a pointer is reachable, what does that exactly mean? That means there's a root somewhere in stack. I told this section, right? Stack section, static section, right? Registration I haven't told, but it's basically uh, just think of it as like very small memory. All the intermediate operations are done in stack registers, and we might have some addresses there. So we'll treat those also as root. So a pointer is reachable implies there's a root somewhere from where we can transitively access the pointer. Transitively meaning through some like in, through it, indirectly we can access the pointer. That means the pointer is reachable. Indirectly or directly, if we can access the pointer, that means it's reachable. I'll show you an example. Think of, also think of root as uh, like you. If you do not know what a graph is, graph is basically bunch of nodes are there and they are they have edges between them. That is, let's say there's two cities, right? Uh, Trichy and then Chennai. They have road between them. So Trichy and Chennai are two nodes. The road is the edge. Think of it like that. In a more like generic term. Though. GC will treat all of the stack variables, register static section as root. So we'll see this example here. These are the type declaration, and then this is the variable here. So this variable, I initialize all the fields properly, A, B, and then X, Y, like. So this is of type O. It will have field one, field two, and then inside it will have A, B, and then X, Y, like. All that is there. So all in this, only this thing is actually in the stack, right? Because everything else will be allocated somewhere else. We only will have access to this at the top thing. We can see it here. This is only what will go on the stack. Everything else will be part of this this struct. We are indirectly accessing other things. This uh, field one, field two, A, B, X, Y. All of them are indirectly accessed. The direct access is root root variable, which is who instance in this case. So basically. This is what the root is. Everything that is directly accessed is the root. And the things that are directly accessed are available in stack or in register or in static section of a program. There are ways for a program to examine those sections and then get all the data from there. And then they can start the uh, collection from those points. It will take one, one root, it will traverse its field 1, field 2, A, B, all of that, and it will make all of them as reachable. Right? Because if this is reachable, I can somehow always reach. What are we thinking from there? So I hope this is clear. So next up is how do you do root finding? Right? It involves a lot of in intricate details actually. It's very system specific and then it depends on what type of garbage collector you have. Garbage collector is just a way to do automatic memory management. What are this what that term is basically the same thing. So if you are actually designing a language with GC supported, when you want to have a design and make a language. Which uses GC to manually manage memory, then you want something called a precise collector. Precise collector is a GC which knows where the roots are. It knows if it if you give it a value, it will tell whether this is a root or not. It stores that information somehow. It can do it by keeping track of header information, a lot of things. There's a lot of ways to do that. Most of the popular language, high level languages, they'll actually use this because this makes it much easier for them to work with. This will avoid a lot of overhead for them. Conservative collection 
is when this another type is called conservative collection. Conservative collection. It doesn't know the roots. It doesn't know whether something is a root or just a value. It will assume everything that it encounters in stack, stack, register, and uh, static as a pointer, and will go all of it. So it's actually it actually ends up doing a lot more work than required. So this is somewhat inefficient in terms of time. But this is somewhat inefficient in terms of space because this has to keep track of some extra information to know whether it's a root or not. They are very unsafe because you have, you let's say you have zero variable. It will treat that also as a pointer. It will try to dereference it or something like that. So it might end up crashing. But they have ways to like work around that. But still, it's inefficient. This is what is used in uh, Bohm, famous, wiser conservative collector for C++. This is not part of standard library, C++ standard library, but some researchers like took a lot of time and designed this for C++. It, it is something that is provided as a library. If you just use it, it will feel like you're writing C++, but it is it is doing garbage collection for you. So we'll come to tracing the C algorithms now. So as I told you, all tracing DC algorithms compute a reachable set, and whatever is not reachable is considered as unreachable on the heap. Memory is recycled in three simple steps. You have a program which will ask for memory. The allocator will give the memory to you. There is a garbage collector which will perform reachability analysis and it will feed objects that are not reachable. And then it will reuse the storage that was used by some other thing previously after you end up store. So that's what it essentially does. There are two tracing based algorithms copying collector and then mark and click collector. Copying collector. It's basically every allocation for it will basically allocate two big chunks of memory of same size A and B, let's say. So all the perform all the allocations will be happening in one space A for now, and then after one point, the allocator may not be able to solve the request. So what it will do is it will perform a collection and then it will move all the memory to the other collection B. So now it will it will swap the rows. It will go in B and then like try to move the pointers back to A next time. So, and while this is happening, all the program activities need to be stopped. The collection should only be happening. So, this is why it's called a stop the old algorithm. Basically, the whole program comes to a stop, comes to a stop, only the garbage collection will run. This is very much needed because, because while you are using the program normally, you might be accessing the memory variables, but those memory, memory may be replaced, changed, or something happens to it in the garbage collector. It might be something with it. So it's very unsafe to use it at the same time. But there are ways to do it. There are, there are very sophisticated algorithms to do it. So what is a copy collector? This is the visual representation, right? This is all the allocated stuff in the A space. And the B space is empty, as I told before. So what is reachable will be compacted together and put it like this. So now all of the space is free. Here the problem was it was very fragmented. Right? Let's say if we wanted a uh, allocation of 100 MBs, but there wasn't a contiguous chunk which had 100 MB size. So it needs to perform collection and move it, move it here. So if it happens like this, we have a chunk of 100 MB size probably here. No? So this is what it does. And doing this compaction, right? this is something called compaction. This, is ha this happens as a routine of copying. Right? This is what happened. So this will actually improve cache performance. Now I told something called cache. What is a cache? So you can think of cache as uh, something which is very easily accessible by your computer. It is nearby to your CPU. Uh, an, an analogy for it would be, let's say your mom puts food for you on the table. You can eat it easily from there, right? It will be faster for you. But if she doesn't, you'll have to go to the kitchen and then get it for yourself. That takes significantly more amount of time. That is basically what's a, what a cache is, but for a computer. It, will, it is easily fetched, fast access memory. So this will help in like cash performance and cash improving cash is kind of a very hot research topic in computer science. They always try to put stuff in cash as much as possible. So this is one particular advantage of copying collection. But the disadvantage is the copying, right? It actually takes quite a lot of time. It's, it's a big overhead. Copying everything that is reachable to another section is a big overhead. So that is the disadvantage. Next up is mark and sweep. So as the name suggests, it's basically two functions. One function is mark, another function is sweep. And then 
in a market you got is correct right? an object can all can be in one of these four states it is this information will be there in its header as i i told you before also right in uh, garbage collection you kind of need to maintain a header to know about uh, free information and all that right so this is what these are the four states that it can be in. if it is blue it, it is free it will be marked blue if it is unreached it will be marked white if it is unscanned it will be marked green if it is scanned it will be marked black this means it's reachable this means it this means gray means where uh, still examining that memory like we haven't finished examining that memory it will be examined soon this means you just cannot reach it and this means it's, uh, it's it is available for allocation if you call alloc only the blue memory will be returned to you that's guaranteed so this is also stop over algorithm so as i told before mark is responsible for what? making all the reachable objects black that that is essentially what it will do everything that is reachable will be marked black and sweep sweep will run after mark has completed and sweep what it will do is it is responsible for making all the unreachable memory unreachable memory is uh, as i said here white memory all of it will be marked all of it, all of this memory will be converted to blue memory because since they are on the you can create so it's just a color change simple so you can this is kind of a pseudo code for it right the whole algorithm is basically the mark algorithm is basically this until your unscanned set is not empty you just get one element from the unscanned set you examine its examine its fields you put those fields in the examined like unscanned set and then you remove the uh, field that you just took to took from the unscanned set to put and put it in scanned set that is what marking will do so this is this will basically end up uh, making all the reachable objects as black and then the next thing is sweep sweep is basically for every chunk of memory you see its header if it is white you turn it into blue that's all now which is better automatic memory management or manual memory management the answer is it depends now case against manual memory management is you will often a lot of times you will end up seeing something like this when you are doing uh, in your program in c++ or c this is very painful to debug as someone who is debug this a lot i can say that this is extremely painful to debug and it may ruin your week or weekend also so this is a case against it one case and another case is you all of you would have used a browser called chrome in chrome 70% of the issues that are there all the bugs that are filed in chrome 70% of them are memory safety issues since chrome is written in a unsafe language like c++ 70% of the bugs are memory related bugs this is a report produced by them and then we all know that chrome is maintained by google googlers are very smart engineers they know how to write code still they can't figure this out somehow so it's very difficult now the case against automatic memory management recently there is an article published by discord they were they told how they are handling trillions of messages they are like discord because discord is like rapid right you message frequently and they basically have trillions of messages now so they needed a way to handle that previously like 5 years back they had published a blog called how they handled billions of messages in that blog they spoke very highly of something called cassandra it is a database which is written in java right java is a automatically memory managed language now the issue that they mentioned in the recent blog in previous messages blog is they told jvm the garbage library is causing latency issues so it is having a lot of gc pauses like got a lot of gc pauses and then they eventually had to switch to something else which is compatible with cassandra called skylar db which uses c++ and rust so that is how they encounter like uh, solve this problem you can read this blog also if you want to so that's basically it. this kind of issues have been encountered by a lot of other companies as well that's basically it for the top some of the advanced topics in memory management is uh, if, and all of these things right the advanced topics they deserve a talk on their own this is something called there is this language called rust which has a very advanced type system which helps you with memory management automatically like if you see rust code you won't actually see malloc and free and all that being called at all it will feel like it's happening automatically it is able to do that through its very advanced type system there is uh, there are ways to like improve the pause for gc right i could 
So that is accomplished through all of this. Increment is a garbage character. Increment is a garbage character is basically doing small, small work of small, small GC work in between. It will still stop the world, but it will only stop it for a small time. And then there are parallel and concurrent GC. Basically, while your program is running, your GC will also run. That is also there. This is there. Like all of this is actually there in Java. Java has seven types of garbage collector built into the language. You can choose. You can choose which one you want to use by a like, command line argument, basically. So this is kind of an active research in computer science. It's basically it for the talk. Thank you, guys. I hope you. Have a Interesting talk. On the like a computer science student, I was really aware of most of these things. You know, initially, Deepesh pitched the talk and all of his thought. It's going to be the driest talk that we have yet. I'm pretty glad I've been proven kind of out because it was interesting to see a lot of how memory is being managed. Uh, I'm guessing third of you are going to have questions, so you can ask them right now. There are other types of bugs as well. Uh, there are uh, bugs such as uh, something called uh, let's say you have a you have you have an array, right? That is being managed properly. But let's say you have access to one of the pointers of that array and you return that. See, there are still you have unique pointers, but you can still access the raw addresses. So people often times will actually have to resort to doing that because systems programming you kind of need point as always. So if they do not do it carefully, they might encounter uh, accessing memory that is already free. That is the use of the free ball that is there. The memory is free properly where it should be. But it's just that there are scenarios where you, are, you might still end up using the memory even after it's free. Those kind of bugs, you need help of like the programming language, its type system. The Rust, for example, will avoid bugs like this. But in C++ it's not possible because it's not part of language type system or anything, right? So some of it, some static analysis tools might help with that also. So you were, you were talking about chat pointers, right? How they allow you to have multiple orders. Like suppose in C++ I have like a doubly linked list. So there is a node, it has two neighbors and both like, and I model it using yeah. chat pointers. So A node A points to B, points to C, C points back to B. And you have cyclic reference. Yeah. So how do you break that in C plus? Ha. You if you end up uh, using shared pointer for the previous and uh, like in a double linked list, there's a previous and next node, right? If you use both of them as shared pointer, uh, you the memory won't be free because you have a cyclic reference. So there is something in C plus plus that is called a weak pointer. I think it's called a weak reference or something. There is something which will help you do that. So basically. The, it won't actually increment the reference count. It will just, it's like, it, it is there, but you are responsible for managing it properly. If you not, if you do not manage it properly, it might end up doing bad things. But if you manage it properly, that is possible to model with a uh, weak pointer. It's called weak I do not remember exactly what it's called, but it is there. That's the way it is. And uh, one more thing you were talking about, uh, the conservative thesis, right? And how they scan. So like, how do they, like, they don't know the type of the data they are scanning. Mm. So suppose there is a random map, random integer. So how, do, how does it know whether it's a pointer to a structure or it's just a... In the conservative GC. Yeah. It won't know that. It will just scan it. It will, it will just scan that. It will treat everything as pointers and it So if it's it like zero and it deal references, you get a set There point. are, I think, see, they have some heuristics to encounter that. And like, uh, fix those things. Like they will, even if they do that, they have ways to escape the memory issues. There is actually this thing is uh, something that went for almost five to ten years. That garbage collector, right? They have like four research paper published on that, which is talking about all of this. So this that is kind of not 
uh, possible to describe this talk. And even to be honest, I am not sure how they do it. I just know they do it. What do you think? So you were talking about copying GCC, yes. right? Suppose I have a pointer to the heap, mm. and uh, like there are two spaces A and B. Mm. So the one space is filled up, so the, all the objects are copied to B. Mm. But now my pointer still points to A, right? So how do you fix that? The copying, right? The, see, you how you get the roots is you go through the whole stack, you go to all the static section, right? That is how you do how you find the roots. So, but you have access to the stack also, right? You know what the stack's memory is. So, what you do is after you move the pointer, you move the pointer there, you copy it. Now you update the stack also properly. You update the value in the stack also properly because at the end. The, everything ends up being this offset from the stack, offset on the stack, right? So if the offset has proper value, it will end up using the proper value because the instructions are never changing. They are only changing the values inside the memory. So it will end up doing the file. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, So you mentioned uh, copy GCs and mark and shape GCs, right? So how will I choose between them if I have to choose it for some project? Are they compiler flags or like libraries or like what is it? No, not uh, all of the compilers will provide both of the GCs. It's just like the language will decide what they what they think is better for you, and it will give you that. Some scheme compiler uses like some scheme interpreter uses a copy collector, but it's not very common. Like most of it is mark and shape nowadays, and then mark and shape also have a variant which will do compaction, basically copying things to make it uh, more cache friendly. There are there are advanced version of mark and sheet basically. But so, you do not get to choose. It's up to the language to implement it. And all of these uh, advanced concepts and all of this, it will be relevant when we are dealing with C++ uh, programs. They are not, no. GC stuff is not relevant. It's only when you are dealing at a very large scale, like tech like, like giant companies, right? right. Thank you. Any other questions? Anyone? Thank you, guys.